Hey everyone, David DeHilster, Dissident Science here tonight, and we're going to be talking about dissidents are in the majority. Can you believe that? Or if you don't believe it, you stick around. I'm going to tell you why that's true. We've got a lot of indications, in fact, that is true. But you are watching Dissident Science Live. <laughs> So uh, welcome everybody. I uh, want to let everybody know that in fact uh, we are continuing to work on our uh, Science Woke website. For those of you who are interested, that's going to be a big launch for us. It'll be May 1st. That's our, our goal. So those who are uh, interested in actually previewing or wanting to help out, we're looking for people to go over it give uh, their feedback but uh, that's really important to us so uh, if you are so inclined and you are interested we uh, are uh, looking for people to, to uh, give you a login and you can actually go and browse around sciencewoke.org to take a, take your take a look at it but tonight we're going to be talking about um, something that is came from one of my videos this week which was from a an email from Dr. Glenn Borkert. He is uh, the infinity guru, also one of the, well, in my opinion, the best science philosopher of our time. But uh, he found this article in this person who was writing about how uh, nothing's going to come out of the crack uh, crackpots who send their own ideas of why Einstein's wrong and their own theories and all those kinds of things. And it, a lot of times when people see that, you get really frustrated. You look at it and say, well, what am I doing? What am I doing on this channel? What am I doing here? Uh, even going against this, maybe this is all crazy. Uh, how is it then uh, we can stand all this? Because we're in just a small minority. Because the way they look at it, the way the mainstream science looks at it, in, in fact, they aren't in the minority. I mean, they aren't in the majority at all. They're in the very, 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 very small minority because if you start really looking at the numbers. So um, I uh, welcome everybody. Uh, we're getting new subscribers every week. I do appreciate it. Let people know. Uh, go down and click on the subscribe button in the little bell next to it. And uh, you'll be alerted when we are doing, when I drop some more new videos. But uh, one of the interesting conversations I've had is with Dr. Alexander Unsker. If you haven't seen uh, my interviews with him, I have a series of three interviews I had very recently with him. And one of the topics I've told and I threatened to talk, uh, talk with him about is actually who goes into these physics uh, positions, cosmology positions, who become the science evangelists, those kinds of people. Uh, where are they coming from? Are they our brightest minds? Are they not our brightest minds? Who are they? How do they get into it? Uh, and it's very interesting because he uh, uh, actually, I'm going to look it up here while I'm talking. I'm going to go to YouTube here and the mock-in. And uh, uh, there's a guy he uh, interviewed, a Nobel Prize laureate. His first name is David. I can never remember his last name because it's sort of undescript it's on David Woods or something like that but I am going to look that up uh, f uh, and, and uh, get the guy's actual name so go to the Machian as in uh, um, the mock uh, 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 mock one uh, which is uh, it's a reference to there we go it's a reference to um, the guy who came up with the speeds and was looking at speeds, all that kind of thing. And uh, I'm not very well versed on that, obviously, but uh, there are there are theories that people have been working on. Uh, there's the Ritz theory of, um, they're looking at relativity, how things really work. They're looking at, I think basically light, if I can remember, light and how that works. And uh, Ritzian is one where it's more like a ballistic kind of thing. Uh, Machian uh, is, is another. But let me uh, look here uh, on his channel and take a look, and I'll get you exactly what it is. I'll show you the interview with the guy. It's uh, one of her, his most, there we go, David Gross. I should just remember it's Gross. Uh, it's a 31 minutes two years ago. 
5,500 views, but uh, it's very interesting. Uh, I'll take a look at it here. And uh, uh, David Gross uh, won the Nobel Prize. Uh, he's Nobel laureate. It's this interview with string theorist and Nobel laureate David Gross. Gross uh, talks about arbitrary numbers on, uh, in physics, about the predictions of the standard model, model and his own contributions to it. Uh, the discussion includes Dirac's large number hypothesis, the predictions of supersymmetry, and the controversial uh, book con uh, Constructing Quarks. Uh, and uh, this interview doesn't end too well, uh, but uh, he is there. You can see uh, he's a, uh, a person that, again, won the Nobel Prize. You can also see by this uh, video that you have 40 likes and 10 people. So that's one out of five people uh, don't like this because, uh, you know, the people come this way to look at them and they're not going to be interested in a guy who's auth who's, who authored the Higgs fake. But it's interesting. The reason I'm uh, talking to you about this is the fact that when uh, uh, Alexander Unsiger talked uh, uh, with David Gross, and asked him, how did you get into particle physics? And okay, this is a guy who won the Nobel Prize. There, you're not, we're not talking about somebody who, you know, is just somebody who decided uh, uh, that that was at the conference, decided to go to the conference and say, this person to win a Nobel Prize, that's huge. And the idea that his uh, prediction about the standard model, he, he uh, this guy's claim to fame is that he uh, made the standard model much more simple and all those free variables, that is, all the knobs and all the arbitrary things that they put on, all their arbitrary models, uh, and they have uh, all these variables that are like um, free variables, and people are saying, come on, this is just a bunch of uh, uh, ad hoc numbers. What are you doing? Don't we have a better system than this? And this guy claims to have uh, reduced that way down. Uh, but it... it, it but again, this guy is a Nobel laureate. Uh, to win the Nobel Prize is huge. I mean, he can go around and talk, of, talk anywhere he wants. Um, he's, I'm sure he's invited. He's well paid. And uh, he, his is, of course, uh, is a string theorist. For those of you who don't know, the string theory was a, a theory that was completely invented for the idea of seeing if we could, they could make one one object, particle, whatever you want, one thing and make the whole universe out of it. It was a mathematical exercise by the original people. And then, in, unfortunately, uh, gener uh, future generations took it as being um, real. They started making programs on the Discovery Channel, all those kinds of things. And, and next thing you know, they're just all these string theorists. But uh, they're also not exactly uh, supported by most phys well, almost any physicists. But to get back to the story about David Gross here, who's talking, uh, I recommend that you watch this just to listen to the way these guys talk, just to, and then and watch uh, the reactions on <laughs> look, <laughs> look at his face. <laughs> there he is, Alexander Unsker, totally on a prince like. You know what are you saying? There's a lot of illogically. There's when when these guys talk. There's a lot of times where they'll say one thing, but and then they'll make a conclusion from it. But there is no logical conclusion for what they say. And then when you question them on it, they get all mad. But I'm off track. David Gross again won the Nobel Prize, and and uh, Alexander Unsker told me when I was talking with him for the uh, interview, pre-interview, post-interview, that in fact. He asked, you know, David Gross, how did you get in this? I mean, obviously you got a Nobel Prize. It must have been in this long trek of, you know, like in anything, any field, you get up and higher and higher and higher until you reach the pinnacle. You're one of the best minds that the human race has because if it's a Nobel Prize, then of course it is really important and you are important. And, you know, Einstein won a Nobel Prize. All these other people, very important people, won Nobel Prizes. So... Uh, how did you get there? This is this must be an amazing story, and and it was really disappointing. Uh, Alexander Unsker finally realized something very important, and in, in the basically David Gross said, "Well, you know, I was going to go into this, uh, then I thought about this, and I decided to go into particle physics." The the, the thing was, it was sort of a wishy-washy decision. It wasn't. He could have easily gone in a different direction. He went into particle physics and. Basically, if you talk to myself and many people out of the dissidents who really look into this, these people basically um, capitulate, meaning 
it's not true that they understand these theories. They say to us they understand these very complicated and paradoxical theories. And when you listen to him, to listen to David Gross talk right there, David Gross, he sounds extremely confident, very haughty, very pretty much arrogant. And what happens is that arrogance comes from that they are uh, convinced they are right. They are convinced that what they say makes sense. And even there's paradoxes, they hide themselves. There's no way you can, you can get around it because they, it is paradoxical, it is problematic, and there are thousands and thousands of people who, who see that. And uh, so it comes down to uh, a guy, David Gross, theoretical physicist, right there, who, who said to Alexander Unsker, oh, I just happened to go into it. Uh, I just decided I'd go into it. And he jumped all through all the, all the hoops, sort of like, ah, I think I'll be a politician. You know, I'm, a, I'm a, uh, a kid from a rich family, inherited all my money, uh, and uh, I don't have anything to do. Ah, I'm going to politics. Doesn't mean they're the brightest person who wants to be a public servant and really serve the public. Ah, that's what they chose. And so basically that's what he chose, and he um, uh, drank all the Kool-Aid, basically, you know, didn't question anything, listened to what was going on, got into this stuff, uh, and found his niche, got his answer, got his ideas into the what I call the unicorn system of particle physics and corralled himself into a position that looked like it solved one of their uh, problems, which are straw man problems. I mean, it was, it was set up by them, by their, their own selves, solved it, and he got a Nobel Prize. So, so if you ask, Alan, I'm, I'm imagining if I ask Alexander Unsker, who's doing this interview, if this guy is like the top of the cream of the crop of critical thinkers, he's not going to, he's going to say no. So what does that mean? It means that the people who are on top, the loud, the, the mouthpieces, the people who win Nobel Prizes, the people who are in these theoretical uh, physics places that get a lot of attention, that billions of dollars are thrown at to make these particle accelerators, and the physics evangelists who parrot everything they say and pretend that they too understand it, and they try to give you beautiful graphics and, and beautiful words and beautiful analogies that make it sound just so right. And when he's taught, when uh, uh, David Gross talks, then uh, you just think, okay, this guy is a super brain, and that's why I always do this. It's, his brain is bigger because, in my opinion, most of everybody's brains are pretty much the same. Yeah, we have chemical differences in it that probably make our synapses get, some of us can make more connections to the other. Some, some brains are wired to do some pretty f freaky things like, you know, Mozart write music without even thinking about it. Other people to remember dates that, you know, photographic memory. But what, you know, these guys, are not super brains. They don't. They, but we. They treat themselves like it. Um, we, uh, our the general public looks at them, and when they hear the mumbo jumbo, that when you listen, I, I watch this. You don't have to understand a word of it. What you need to understand is that. The, the reason you don't understand a word of it is because it's unintelligible. It's not that it's that you don't understand. And that's what happens. What will happen is the moment that, that um, Alexander Unsker is questioning David Gross, he's, he's getting frustrated like, well, little boy, you don't know what you're talking about. And, and oh, I know you're, oh, I've heard that argument. And yeah, uh, we know, we know. And then this guy, you know, David Gross finally figures out that um, you can see him. He's already getting frustrated. We're what? Oh, yeah, about you're going to see he's getting more frustrated and frustrated. He was starting out like, oh, I'm pontificating to you. But this guy is not the cream of the cream of the crop. Uh, most of the best physicists and minds and engineering people uh, don't follow theoretical physics. And why is that? Because the moment they're told things like, oh, when you go close to speed of light, mass increases. Oh, there's space time and it bends. Well, that doesn't make sense. What space? What space is nothing. Time isn't really a thing. And um, uh, you can see he's like nervous. He's now sitting back and he's in a sort of a, that's what happens. He's getting punched there. But uh, <laughs> 
But anyways, the the whole point of of watch you, again, you can see the frustration building on his face. And the the moment you point out any of these very inconsistent things, where they say one thing and then say another, you can see now he's on the defensive and he's not looking there. He's getting frustrated. He's not looking into the eyes where he was before. You can see. Okay, will will Alexander Unsucker get another interview with this guy? Never. Uh, that's for sure. But um, again. I think it's really important that uh, uh, you guys know that, uh, in fact, uh, we uh, dissidents are in the majority. And the reason is, is because, believe it or not, most physicists are dissidents. And the reason they're dissidents is because they don't believe the, 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 big, uh, the big stories of big physics and big cosmology. Uh, lots of them don't believe in the Big Bang. Lots of them. Majority of them don't. People think, well, there's a Big Bang. The people who say they believe in the Big Bang. And, oh, let's make sure we're talking about the what group I'm talking about. I'm talking about people who really want to understand physics. I'm not talking people who parrot. If you parrot and you just talk blah, 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 no. I'm looking at people who are critical thinkers. And those, you know, critical thinkers, uh, people who are engineers even, my father, was an electrical engineer. He told me that when he uh, learned about special relativity, he just thought it was it was he he got his degree in engineering physics, engineering physics. Uh, he didn't get it in pure physics because he thought it was it was cockamamie, and and that's what they say what we are cockamamie. So the whole idea that when these things come out and these people win Nobel prizes and the and you hear you see article after article like the one that I talked about this week in my last video go watch that video it's a really it was one of my better videos it goes on for 30 minutes but it's really worth watching the whole thing and that came from Dr. Glenn Borkert's uh, pointing out of this person who's saying uh crack crack pack uh cockamamie crackbots well uh uh, what do you do? And at the end, I, 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 my answer to that, to spoil it, is that, um, in fact, we are in the majority. If you were to get 100 people who are engineers, scientists, physicists uh, together who are not theoretical physicists or cosmologists or astrophysicists, and you gave them, okay, I'm going to name you some things. What do you, how, how much do you believe this is correct? you say the Big Bang. Do you believe that's correct, that everything blew out of, uh, of nothing and then it's all spreading out? But even though uh, as we see deeper and deeper, the more telescope, the better telescopes we get, guess what happens? We see deeper and we see more galaxies and more things that shouldn't be that mature at that, that speed. What do you think? You think the Big Bang's got some big problems? Yep, I would believe the majority would say so. In particle physics, with all these particles and quarks and, and gluons and um, W and Z particles and uh, the Higgs boson, what do you think about all that? Do you think that these things are real or do you think it's possible that these people are just playing around in a fantasy land? You guess, yeah, you know, wake me up when there's something real. And how about relativity, which says that as you get closer to the speed of light, mass increases, time slows down. You know, some people may say, well, you know, isn't somebody, but, you know, if you really ask them and you say, does, does that make sense? Does space-time bending make sense to you? And they're going to say, no. Nah. Most of the engineers are going to say, yeah, wake me up when you get something real. That's the way I sort of put it. I put it into that one phrase. So it's, it's something that, in my opinion, um, really places us in a very strong position. It's very much like the political position where we have right now in the world uh, a, a very small pe amount of people who have an immense amount of, of wealth where the rest of us have been, you know, nothing's going up. My salary was the same. I'm a professional. It was the same for like 16 years. When you have uh, people in power like that, the majority are, are we the people? You know, the moment we, we, we uh, grab our pitchforks and we all march the millions and millions against the few oligarchs, as they say, mm -hmm. Um, I, we have the power the same way with with this you know people say Dave how are you going to convince the universities that we should be looking at lots of different models not just one and that science shouldn't be a consensus it should be like everything else we should be able to question anything well, you're not going to change the universities no we're not going to change the universities. we're going to change people and when people are changing what's going to happen is eventually those people are going to make it into universities and eventually those things things will change but right now, with the internet the way things are, 
we're getting a lot of people. Uh, all the suspicions, one of the greatest commonalities between the people like yourselves who are watching is the fact that, you know, you read these things in mainstream science and mainstream news about science or you see programs and you're thinking, that's cockamamie, that's, that's ridiculous. What are they talking about? Multiverses. And if you don't, if I look at something and you look at something, that that it will behave differently. And that you know, quantum eraser history, history eraser uh, 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 particles that know about another particle's state instantaneously across a distance. That's an impossibility in the physical world. There is no such thing. That's magic. That's complete magic. So when you're talking about the quantum mechanics, oh, they got quantum computers. They, quantum computers just means they're not using ones and zeros. They're using uh, a, a spectrum of stuff, and they're trying to use you know atomic uh, the way uh, materials and meto atomic structures to do that kind of stuff. It's not quantum mechanics. The, the, all of a sudden, it's not where everything we do is a physical world. The, and, and the problem the the problem is is that. We have all these people and all these crazy things and people like yourself read these and say, what's going on? Find this channel. And so I'm sort of like people say, hey, you're like the Bernie Sanders of science. You know, I remember when I first saw Bernie Sanders, it was like this old guy yelling. It's like, I can't believe, you know, somebody comes across uh, my video, one of my more popular videos where I'm talking about uh, um, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, who uh, was asked point blank if Einstein could be wrong. And he laughs. I mean, that's... That's not a scientific, uh, there's no scientists or journalists uh, uh, who are, are being honest if they don't say, well, yeah, it could be, Einstein could be wrong. In fact, everything is wrong. All we're doing is we're less make, trying to make things less wrong. I mean, that's basically what we're doing. But uh, um, so you guys are, are like, well, where do I go? Who's a voice for this? And that's what I'm trying to do and other people are trying to do as well. I think I'm just doing it a little bit more way to try to get this out there, get this out there in, in, the, in the world. But, and so I'm trying to, trying to put together philosophies uh, that we can use in the future so that we can show other gener the, the people like you, yourselves that, look, it is open. Here's the way I was, I was really thinking about it. Um, and um, that's one of the, I think that's one of the nice things about the live session. I don't, uh, when I, a lot of times when I write things down, I don't I don't get these things. But you know, we have this. The people who I know are the best critical thinkers, and the way I look at myself, and I, I consider myself a very good critical thinker. I'm not saying I'm brilliant. I'm just I, I, as critically thinking. I allow myself everything to, to imagine everything. I allow myself to, so when I get a book that looks crazy that this person says this is a new idea and a new model. Uh, I, I really go, well, maybe this guy found it. You know, I, I'm always curious. I'm always thinking, maybe this guy's got something. It's like, hey, this is great. The universe is absolutely amazing. People have been have spent, many of these people who send me books, and I got, I've got dozens of books that people just send to me because they know I'll take a look at them. Um, and uh, I'm thinking, these people spent sometimes decades thinking about this. What are they, what are they thinking about? Why did they do that? Um, what did they find? Did they find something that was earth shaking? It's like when I, I don't know how I came across Yonel Denou and his underwater experiments. I think he was a part of the MPA Natural Philosophy Alliance, which is now the CMPS. And he said that, um, I, then he, I think he gave a talk and then I saw his, un, he, he was telling me, I think it was, I met him before he did these videos. He said he had his kids pool and he was doing these experiments and then when I saw them underwater just spools just rotating discs in water and they repelled and, and attracted identically uh, as if they were magnetic fields blew my mind still blows my mind it was a seminal moment in in my opinion in science history because there we had a very clear indication at least what I call an effect that would give us what looks like what what happens with magnetism in a physical way it's it was a f body a fluid body that was going around and around and the pressure differences between it when they flowed together and when they flowed apart it turns out that when we really look at the Donu effect 
it's a little bit more complicated. But what's really important is how those things are out there. And we all should be just curious about this. You know, this idea that we get closed minded, even with the people with their own theories, they just get, they fall in love with their theory. They don't look at other theories. I'm always looking at other stuff. I'm always looking at the ether theories because there's so many of them out there. Look at Jeff Yee. What has he done? What's he doing? Um, other people who have their models. So, oh, somebody has said something. Welcome, everybody. I do you see you guys hanging around. I know they come in and out. Let's see, how does one share such a book with you? Oh, well, send it to me. Um, send me an email. And if you have a book or a book that you wrote or you would like me to take a look at, I will certainly do that. I'm sort of behind on my books. Uh, I try to, uh, I have to read them, obviously, and then go through them and pick out stuff that I think is, uh, you know, worthwhile. And then uh, uh, I, I always look at books as positive. Why am I going to waste, well, the only time I waste people's time on uh and I do uh, mm -hmm. quite a bit, actually. Waste people's time on uh, how uh, things that are negative is teaching people to pick apart the prob problems of mainstream science today in in model, modern journalism. That's why you see me go through so many articles, and I've told this story many times. My mother, uh, God rest her soul, who is in my film Einstein Wrong. Go, you can go see it online, EinsteinWrong.com. Very entertaining film. Uh, take a look at it. Um, but uh, in there, uh, she went from basically not knowing anything about dissident science to really becoming friends with lots of them. And there's two conclusions she came up with. And one was they're really bright and they're not crack, crackpots. They're not crazy people. And, and secondly, she became uh, uh, scientifically awoke. After she talked and went to many lectures and listened in, it started seeping into her brain. And she would read stuff and she would literally come up to me at times and says, Dave, I, wrote the, I read this thing about black holes the other day. In the, in, in the, I heard about that or I saw it on TV. It's nuts. They say things that contradict, because they say one thing and then they make a conclusion that's completely different from what they were saying. And the words they're using, they're magical. They don't give you any physical thing. They're just using all these terminology. Uh, so she was recognizing things were paradoxical. She was recognizing that they were using their magic words. That it sounds, She says, it sounds all pretty, but when you really sit and you say, okay, wait a minute, I'm going to listen to what you say. I'm going to try to follow your logic. Boy, the thing falls apart right in front of your eyes. So you know, that's what this channel is, and that's why I do those things that are negative. But if someone sends me a book on something completely new, because I still owe somebody, I'll give you another, it's the Sapphire Project by Electric uh, Universe. <sighs> I don't know why when I do this on Friday night, I'm yawning all the time, but um, uh, the Electric Universe is doing a Sapphire Project. I have wa I've watched the videos, I've looked at it. It doesn't have a super whole lot of information, but it does have information on the website. And I promise to do a video on it. I always look at these things in a very positive light. I then also give my opinion about really what's going on. I know they are trying to do uh, use the idea of an electric universe to try to do new things and perhaps uh, give the world some scientific breakthroughs perhaps, or even sci scientific insights through real experiments. And their hopes, of course, is to show the world's a lot more electric than we think it is. And that's absolute, that's what they should do. And they should take that into to the nth degree if they can. Because in the end, if we keep doing that and everybody knows about it, either one thing will shake out or parts of that, that will have useful stuff and another model will have other useful stuff or something will come along and subsume that. Um, you know, we have a model that we understand what's electric part of the universe and what isn't electric part of the universe and we even know what that means, but that's on our model. Now, if that's interesting to somebody, that's great. If it's not, it's great too, because look, we're all born. This is a free society. I can be born, do what I want, think what I want. I can, I can look at the world and come up with any model I want. There are no laws against that. And there shouldn't be. Everybody should be free 
thinkers. I mean, my goodness, we're mechanizing the whole world so we don't have to do work. I mean, isn't that, when I was a kid, that's why I always thought, let's have machines do everything and we can just have, we can just do art and music and, and come up, talk about theories and try to make better models of the universe. And we don't have to make a living, wash the dishes, uh, wash our clothes, uh, do all these things, cook our food. I mean, that was, that's the idea. So this idea that we want to keep ourselves free, but that's not what happens in the universities. They will tell you what is right, and you will not deviate from that. And they, uh, it's a long story, but um, it, it has to do with nerds want to be loved. I think I did a, I think I did a, a early video on that. And that is my conclusion. Nerds want to be loved. They were picked on when they were kids. I was picked on when I was a kid because I was sort of a nerd and a pacifist. I didn't get into bullying. I didn't care about that. I was curious about the world. And, um, you know, um, I, I even said to myself when I was being bullied a lot, I said, you know, someday I'm going to come up with a theory and I'm going to make myself really smart. And they're all going to have to admire me. And it's really funny because I never had a theory, never thought I would. And I don't have a model. And it turns out my dad, all the things that I had seen and collected over the years, it wasn't a model. It was just things like the, the new effect, infinity. Um, and then my father came up with a, with a, a solution for the particle uh, wave, particle duality. And then I talked with my dad and said, hey, let's, you know. But that was something that when you have these nerds, these people who are ma in many ways autistic, I have autistic uh, tendencies. I was very introverted. I was very... Uh, um, uh, not good socially. Uh, I'm very different now, uh, but you know, a lot of times I'd rather, when I'm thinking, just be myself. I don't, I, you know, or if I'm at a party, mm -hmm. I want to talk about pretty heady things. But you know, we nerds uh, have, uh, well, lots of nerds have this uh, uh, emotional need to be loved, to be admired. So they'll go into these uh, uh, professions like. Uh, physics and those people will then want to become admired they're not interested necessarily in finding truth anymore they just want to come back with a Nobel Prize like uh, uh, David Gross did and even though I chose I was going to choose this and then it just but I decided to go into particle physics and you know I accepted everything and I you know did I bought into everything they did and I came up with my own little thing and it turned out winning a Nobel Prize it's really just the right person at the right place and the right time with the with and, and it's all it's all unicorns but who cares but it's sort of the revenge of the nerds. The nerds want to be loved kind of thing. Uh, that was, that's a conclusion I've come up with. So, uh, And if again, if you have a book that you have that you've written or someone else or something that you want me to take a look at, you can either uh, send me an email or, or uh, 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 tag me in Twitter, uh, Twitter or something like that. And because I'm starting to get more active out there, I'm trying to get myself out there so uh, I can start. Uh, uh, that's what I do a lot. I actually go to uh, Einstein wrong. I'm wrong. That's just in the brain because I did it for almost 10 years. But uh, Einstein's Facebook page. I wonder how many people are there now. It, it was it got stuck at 19 million. I don't I don't know if it's gotten any higher. I have this theory that people are uh, unimpressed with him anymore. They're just like yeah. There's nothing that ever comes out of it, and that's why I, 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 my contention is the reason that Einstein's Facebook page, well, it's, first of all, it's run by somebody who actually just registered it before everybody else did, uh, and then found out, oh, I'm on a gold mine of, 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 of marketing, and uh, got some money from when they did the uh, uh, series on, oh, forget what it was, was it PBS or something with Einstein? I can't remember, Discovery Channel? No, Nat Geo. It was Nat Geo genius that's what it was and uh so einstein let me see if albert einstein has gone above the 20 million mark because he's been there for literally a number of years and i have this theory of why it's gotten stuck yep there we go i am right so dave d hilster's hypothesis must be right no it's not it must be right but there he is albert einstein um, you know, that's a favorite picture, I think, there. And uh, where are the number of uh, people that he has following? There it is, stuck at 9,300,000. Uh, and he's been there, not, does not go above uh, 19 million. Now, the reason I think that's true, and I think this is a good hypothesis, actually, 
is the reason Albert Einstein, oh, first of all, he's dead. Uh, second of all, his, his, his works don't do anything for me. Nobody gets interested in something that does nothing for them. When people say this, the stock phrase that GPS wouldn't work without uh, Einstein's relativity, they go, ah, yeah. why? Because NASA doesn't use relativity anywhere when they're we're doing their space stuff. Uh, SpaceX doesn't use relativity anywhere. But if you listen and if you listen to your professors, they will say, in fact, professors will go into, this is interesting about GPS, professors will, go, will, will launch into a mathematical expression of how general relativity has to be used in, in GPS. But guess what? That is a conjecture because it's not made by anybody who worked in GPS. What it was was somebody somewhere some textbook writer or some uh, physics teacher decided that they would try to, in their mind, apply ge uh, 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 um, general relativity to GPS. And therefore, they came up with an explanation. And that's what's been taught. And the people like Ron Hatch, um, who say, in fact, uh, no... There's problems with it. Uh, let me go to our uh, website. Um, I'll go to Science Woke. There we go. And, um, oh, good. Appreciate the efforts of thoughtfulness. I've written a book on independent research and made videos, etc. I would, would get a PDF and some links and email. Absolutely, Steve and Scully. Absolutely. Um, I will uh, take a look at everything and anything, especially if it's something new. And... Um, so um, this is what I, uh, this GPS guy who has over 30 patents says about Einstein and uh, GPS relativity. And that's why I don't like going here and uh, watching, having you guys watch this because what I don't want is to make videos of me browsing the internet. I'd rather uh, talk about it. But here's the website we're going to be launching in. Um, uh, May 1st, we're going to go to the memes section, which are very similar, if not, well, they're identical to the memes that we have for um, uh, our CNPS with, uh, I think, one or two different I put in there. But um, let's go down here. Here we go. Our friend Ron Hatch. Uh, this is a meme. These are memes we'll have available and maybe, hopefully, then people who are critical thinkers will uh, spread these memes far and wide. In fact, I made one meme that I'll have to show you guys um, that actually I see people have picked up on Facebook. I made it last year and I shoved it out there uh, because again, I do graphics. So I took a t-shirt and I modified with the t-shirt because they were trying to sell it. And then when people talk about particle physics and I, and I, I shove this out at them, uh, to be the opposite uh, side of it. But let's go uh, before I get in there. Okay. Anyways, these memes are there. You can see it's all been, um, it's all there for our science woke, our nice uh, logo there. It says, uh, Ron Hatch, holder of over 30 GPS patents. This is what he says. And this is a quote from my movie. And I asked him, I said, Ron, could you give me a phrase that would sum up the problems with relativity and GPS? I want you to word it exactly how you would. Uh, say it because I tried to put words in his mouth. He goes, no, it doesn't prove it wrong. Um, but it does point this out. And he says, rather than supporting relativity theory, GPS, GPS actually reveals flaws in relativity, relativity theory. And now I guess that's one way of saying, well, okay, it doesn't necessarily prove it wrong, but Maybe it can be modified. I don't know. Uh, study Karazani, that's the best modification I, I've seen. Um, and you can see that's Ron Hatch from the documentary uh, film Einstein Wrong. Uh, but anyways, that's, that's pretty cool. And um, there was something else I was going to say. Um, anyways, he does give some talks. You can actually see those talks uh, any, uh, with... Um, uh, on our website, so go to um, John Chappelle Natural Philosophy Society, and you will see, or just go to John Chappelle, you will see uh, some of his talks. Very interesting. Um, anyways, pretty cool. 
uh, and uh, he did actually wrote a wrote one. He actually wrote two books. Oh, well, no, I think he wrote one book, and in the movie you can see it. Oh yeah, well, it's for those who don't know, I do. I do uh, get people watching the movie, uh, which never made it into the uh, film festivals because. They said we we don't put crack. They didn't they didn't watch. I actually had one one person. I've told this story before at the Oxford Film Festival. They don't like Einstein. They like Newton. And I had a, a guy cheering me on. I made it into the finals, and they decided uh, they didn't want the controversy. We can't have that. So uh, here is uh, Einstein Wrong uh, website. This is a little condensed. This is almost what you would see on your phone. That's why you see this menu up here like that. Uh, but you can watch it online. It's like three bucks. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, anyways, uh, if you do watch the movie, you can uh, see, in fact, uh, whoops, not the crew. Oh, boy, do I look young there, huh? Cast. Uh, featured scientists. Here are the featured scientists in the film. There he is, Ron Hatch, entrepreneur, GPS scientist, holder of 30 uh, patents. Um, uh, Do Dr. Domina Eberly Spencer, she got her degree at MIT uh, in mathematics in 1942. Now, uh, those people who are, are pretty young, uh, it's hard to imagine uh, those who was, I wasn't born then myself, but I was born in 1959, just not too far from that, 11 years from that. But she, uh, to get a degree as a woman from MIT, and especially in mathematics, extremely brilliant. Uh, so she's in the film. She talks about um, the data, the raw data from the atomic clock plane. So if you're interested in, uh, uh, you know, seeing some real evidence against uh, special relativity, go watch the film, and you will in fact see her talk about what the problem was. She was given. It was really interesting. A really interesting story. Uh, and that story with Dr. Uh, Eberly is that she contacted the original um, uh, guys who did it, Keith, Keith, Heffel and Keeling, Keating or something, Heffel and Keating. And those uh, guys, I think I even say it here. There she is with her chihuahua. She's, I think, still alive. But uh, she talks about in the movie, yeah, there it is. The, the Haley Keating experiment, which shows that supposedly that uh, clocks slowed down when they were put on atomic planes. Well, she t she got she asked them for the data, and it turns out that uh, the raw data shows that they chose a data point 25 hours before the, the experiment started. Okay, I, I, listen to what I'm saying. Uh, uh, again, uh, the way they made it. It showed Einstein to to match Einstein's prediction. They actually chose a data point that was 25 hours before the experiment started. Okay, let's say you have an experiment with a machine, which they did, which was an atomic clock, but and it had to be moving. And um, let's say that experiment requires a machine to be turned on, so the experiment really can start. Well, the the equivalent of this is that that. Uh, uh, Haley and Keating, Ke uh, Keating, what they did was to make the curve when they graphed it, they started the graph of the experiment 25 hours before they turned the experiment on. That's absurd. And you know what? I, I won't tell you. Watch the film. She has a brilliant, brilliant answer. You don't have to know anything. The way she described it any human being who is logical would understand what she said. She said something very funny, and my mom did, in fact, laugh at that. So uh, very, very well, much well look at that. Take a look at the film. It's only three bucks. Hey, what, what does it go to? It doesn't go to me. It goes to keeping that online. It's like $200 a year to have a film that people can see online and then it streams and all that. I don't want to put it up into YouTube. I'd rather have it in a place in a little bit more dignity than just throw it out there. So, um, and I, a lot of people invested in it and that's a, another thing. So I try to keep it that way so that people understand that there is some dignity to that film, even though we put it out there, people, uh, uh, I'm sure would, uh, 
Who knows? Who knows what would happen? Maybe get into a film festival. And there's Dr. Edward Dowdy, who's in the film as well. Uh, he talks about how light doesn't bend because of gravity. Let's see. A retired NASA scientist, laser, laser optic physicist. In fact, he was on Einstein, Einstein's um, page and he had 20 or 30,000 people view a question that the Einstein said, uh, the Einstein page says, could this NASA scientist be right? Well, because he's a NASA scientist. Dr. Cynthia Whitney is also in there. She's an MIT mathematician and physicist. She wrote her doctoral on, on relativity. And guess what? She's questioning whether relativity is, is correct. And she says, it's Einstein's turn. We got to look at him. If he's wrong, he's wrong. So she writes the, a journal for called Galilean Electrodynamics. You guys, if you have questions, that's what this is here for. I'm here tonight also for you guys' questions, not to drone on. Even though um, these people do watch these uh, live videos, I guess they do like to uh, hear the stream of consciousness. That sometimes comes from this, but uh, a lot of the people who uh, uh, are my subscribers, so there's a group of people, I think... Uh, you know, they, they, they will make it some nights and not others. Usually there's a lot of discussion uh, with their own ideas. I know there are a lot of people uh, who are subscribers to my channel who are subscribers to the idea of Electric Universe. I can talk about that, what I think about it. Um, if you want, want uh, me to talk about that, uh, if you have a question, uh, maybe something that even I've covered before. I know there is even some earlier videos I probably am going to redo. Here are some of the videos that I have coming up that I want to be doing on the photon. Uh, the, put it in a simple uh, phrase, a, pho a photon cannot exist. The reason is, is, is light is information. We have even different colors of light. That information cannot be transmitted with one particle. There has to be lots of particles. So if you want to call them photons and the waves, or you're calling the waves an ether, uh, but the rule, the whole thing is a photon doesn't exist. It's either like an ether particle or a gravity particle, some other particle, and that the result is, is uh, light waves in that in one way or another, or in a lattice, but it cannot be one particle. Well, I'll be doing a, a video on that. Sort of hit me with a ton of bricks that you know, uh, information science, like when we store information in a computer, when you're watching this, you're watching this on, on something that's transmitting in, in millions of colors. Those millions of colors are being transmitted. It's not like uh, a blue photon's coming at you and a red photon's coming at you. Uh, so that's that's the whole idea. But I'm going to be doing a, a video on that. I'll be doing a video, like I said, on the Sapphire Project. Somebody wants me to do on that. Uh, I have books. I have to do it on the... I, I, I bought the book uh, uh, Lost in Math and someone in my subscribers said I'm not going to ever get to interview her. Anybody here say that? Um, that would be uh, something that would be uh, that was that was disappointing. I, I did I did try to I did contact her and I got zero. She probably took a look at it and oh, went screaming into the night. This guy's a crackpot and uh, because I know Alexander Unsker and um, also um, Sabine uh, Hoffenfelder, uh, I think is her name, uh, they do uh, believe some things that are correct, that Einstein is uh, correct in, in some of those, uh, some of his ideas, and uh, I am not so much, and a lot of us aren't. But the thing with uh, Alexander Unsker, he doesn't get, to, he doesn't seem to be bothered by it too much. So, uh, anyways, uh, yeah, Steve, I guess, is going to be sending me stuff. That would be great. Light was never explained with single photons. Uh, yes, it was. It's called the photoelectric effect. That's where it came from. Steve, uh, look up uh, the photon. The photon was actually in, in proposed by uh, Einstein. And Einstein said that a photon hits a surface. And that's a photoelectric effect and it knocks an electron out. He didn't say photons, he said photon. So the photon in your mind, because you want to make it logical, uh, 
is that way and that's what my talk is going to be about but it's also going to to point out that we have three very viable models for what light could be ether particles coming in waves like my father and i have or a lattice and all three can describe light some better than others um, our model i think is has the least amount of problems at least that we can see but um you know <laughs> <laughs> not saying it's right but uh yes they come in waves and we talk about them oops what am i doing that's not what i wanted to do clicked on the wrong thing there <laughs> but yes and i'm not talking about the resultant light i am saying let me say it again the photon singular a particle that is light is not a con that is an impossible concept that light, in fact, has to be part of a multitude of particles or things or whatever it is because it cannot be one thing. And Einstein and the rest of particle, uh, the rest of mainstream physics calls it, yes, it acts like a wave, but it's a particle. And, and if Einstein said that there's a photon, there's a photon. And so that's what I'm saying. You have to look at what mainstream says. We got to be careful and not interpret our interpretations on the mainstream, which they're not saying. They are conf confused as heck because they have a problem. They don't have a medium for light. Therefore, they don't have part. They have photons, but they don't have like my father's model of how particles, like a what they call a photon, in plurality with more than one can actually transmit information that we need that that looks just like light whether it's um, waves in the ocean or waves in the air like the, the, which is an ether model or waves of particles like we do we have in our model which are bombers they're just uh, coming in waves uh, and even more is formed by a large assembly of photons yeah um, but the problem is, is they don't say how that is. They do not have the particle wave model that my father has, for instance. It's not found anywhere. They don't talk about it that way. You are saying that, Steve, and I'm not arguing with you to be mad at you. But that's not the way. That's in your mind. And so when you are saying photons are that way, you cannot pick up a physics book and do this. Like in our book that we have, my father and I, because that's my father's here we go looking for my books again is this one of them no gosh darny dingle um where do i put my our book it's so funny i, I put them all over the place here we go. i think it is no it's so funny did i put them all together here here it is yeah i did So, Steve, there is no such thing as this. If you subscribe to it, then you're subscribing to our model because we don't have... That's not a mainstream idea. It's in our book here. See those, see those guys? In our particle model, that's the way it works. In fact, it's pretty chaotic. When atoms let go of their electrons, what we call G1 particles, because G1 particle In our, our model... Anything that goes at the speed of light is the same particle. We just call it G1 particle because we're getting away from photon and all that because it does many things. When those come at them and like um, uh, atoms and molecules are letting off electrons, they let them off in spurts. And that's how we get colors and all that. That is not the way mainstream thinks about it. Absolutely not. And in fact, if they did, I would have had that aha over a long time ago and maybe they would have come up with the particle model the way we're working on it. I'm not here, folks, saying that we're right. I'm here saying that we, the mainstream science doesn't do that. Let's see, that said, a photon of a certain frequency cannot pass through a certain holes. See, there's no such thing as a photon that has a certain frequency. You can't have that. Frequency, rem here, you guys are making me do my talk now. Maybe I won't have to do it. I'll just take a piece of this. Here's what happens with frequency. Frequency, by definition, is how frequent is something? That's a repeating action. It's not one 
photon. So if you can't have a photon with a frequency, it doesn't happen. Sorry. That's what I'm saying. That's what my, well, this is going to help me, uh, Steve. Again, I'm not, I'm not picking on you here. Okay. So what we would say, mainstream science doesn't say that, but what we would say is that if you're an etherist, you would know how those waves work and that you would be waves in an ether that are, that are, that are traveling. Uh, if it's a particle model, we'll say those are waves of particles so that when you have a frequency that doesn't make it through, it's because you have bunches of particles coming at you in a frequency, brum, 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 like that, all these, lots of them, not one. And uh, that we can we can describe everything with our model. We can describe all those things: microwaves, what what why colors exist. We can even describe how, why white light turns into a uh, colored rainbow. And nobody has, I don't think, been able to explain that. But again, I'm not here to say that we've got the answer. I'm just saying that mainstream doesn't talk about it that way. Uh, a particle with less frequency acts like a bigger particle. See, the problem is right there, in my opinion, Steve, is that, you know, that's, it, that's interesting to say. But when you translate into physicality, we're still nowhere. It doesn't, what's the system? If you explain that to me, I, and I have a pretty visual mind because I'm a visual person, um, I can't actually do much if I don't have a picture of it in my head, as we say. I don't get that. No, it's, you, again, from what I can see, if you if today is my last day on Earth, I will tell you what I think is true. It's either ether, it's either particles, uh, waves of particles, it's either waves in a field of particles, or it's a wave in a lattice of particles where it's more rigid. Which one's right? I wouldn't bet on any of them because they all could be uh, one of them. Any one of them could be right. Einstein himself uh, doubted his model of photons. He compared it to a beer, uh, beer. Beer comes in pints, but it doesn't mean that the beer itself is quantized pints. Yeah, that's, this is where when my father said, I'm, he, he, my father came up with the solution for the wave-particle duality when he was trying to uh, look at ether because uh, he was working on gravity and some people were uh, uh, etherists and not graviton people like himself. So he said, how would I come up with gravity? Well, it'd be a low frequency. Uh, that would be low frequency waves in the ether that would make gravity because it has to be a sort of a slower, not so intense thing. But he couldn't come up. So he said, well, is there a way that I can make particles, plural, into waves? And he goes, yeah. Just like we send waves of light particles, and we call them particles, let's say waves of white beams as Morse code. When we have our fiber optics, we are watching this video through that technique. We are sending, <laughs> boom, a key. It's like here, there, there, here, there, here, there. And those things get interpreted, reinterpreted into a signal that's a code for a color that thing puts through, and those are sent through in the screen and into your eyeball. So it may be the case that you guys are thinking that or you're saying, well, that makes sense, but it ain't out there. It has never, I've never seen it ever described until my father has. And then, in fact, that um, the idea that, um, oh, we can't tell it's a wave or a particle. The problem is, is like for the photoelectric effect. How do we describe the photoelectric effect that Einstein says? Well, it's real simple. Um, you have to have enough particles with enough force that what we call light will 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 jar out of an electron what's exactly happening there we're not going to know until we actually come up and say we do have particles they're called these particles it's either uh, waves in an ether and then we can calculate those we can calculate the size of those and then we can explain it or there are particles like g1 particles and we know the size and how they go and what was needed and what we see is that you've got enough of those things it's like shooting a bunch of ping pong balls brrr, at once you can shoot one and not going to happen nothing's going to happen but you shoot a bunch of them when you get the right amount in the right way it's going to come out so it doesn't even the photoelectric effect can easily be described not as one photon um, but as many particles the electron being uh, the bottle uh, let's see pint bottle 
he compared it to beer. Beer comes in pint bottles, electron. So what are you saying that the electron is made up of a bunch of photons? I, I'm not. I'm not trying to argue or say it's right or wrong or make fun. I, I'm not sure I understand that. I have given up on particles at this point as well. That's funny because our we can we're constructing the whole darn universe out of particles. But of course, to us, a particle is anything that's massed together, and those every particles made of subparticles and I'm not talking about they're all round and all this it's not that it's a, mm -hmm. um, a, a galaxy is a particle uh, um, a sun is a particle uh, an atom is a particle a nucleus of an atom is a particle um, the G1 is a particle in our model that's light gravity electrum uh, um, magnetic fields and electricity and electrons so you know no problem no if you gave up the particle that's that's why is because people aren't thinking of the picture that my you know my father came up i've got a better picture well not a better picture but one that's more how do you say mathematical that was one of, oh, oh wow this is our book looking at it goes this isn't our book it's um I'm trying I'm sorry. I should be talking here. Talking, talking, talking. Don't stop talking. Here we go. These are illustrations from our book. Um, this one here is a traditional ether model. You have one particle hitting into t particle two, two then moves, hits into particle three, three, th three then moves and hits in particle four, and that's how you get waves. That's, a, that's the way uh, sound works. That's how you're listening to me right now. Then you have my father's uh, wave of particles, and this is what happens. All of them are traveling at sea, all of these. So this is going, but if they travel in C, you get a big bunch in the beginning. There's a frequency there. You can map it out. And they're all like bombers traveling all together. There you go. That's what my dad, that was a big revelation in April of 2015. I saw that and I went nuts. Okay, this is another uh, diagram I made. Man, I had to come up with new ways to plot all this stuff because it doesn't exist. You're talking about I had to come up with graphics. I didn't draw this by hand. Um, there we go. Whoop, it's on this side. So what you see there are, there you go, particles. Are, remember, they're all traveling together. You can see this book. I was marking it up because <laughs> it's a, we printed it out today. And you can see I plotted on top of it what we would call the frequency. You can see the trough and you can see the high part. And in fact, I made this to be a very sinusoidal. So if you have particles flowing in those types of waves, that's what you would see. But it turns out that's an idealistic way of the way it works. It doesn't work that way. Things are shoved out and just, well, all, all it has to happen is somewhere in the universe all around us, all this why you have all this light, something's coming at us in a, a regular frequency. And when that hits the nuclear patterns of molecules, it reflects back to us in waves. So white light goes at it, it comes back at us, and we get colors. That's, that's, that's part of our, that, our explanation. So, okay, let's go back here. Being us, I have given up on particles uh, as well. The ether model is becoming more likely in my mind. <laughs> there you are, seduced by the ether model. No problem. No problem. Um, <laughs> ether is seductive. And the reason ether is seductive is because we see and we have been taught waves as particles. Guess what happened in electronics, everybody? Everybody who is an etherist out there, raise your hand. Who is more who thinks it's ether? I'm sure every one of you raising your hand except me, and that's cool. Okay, those people raise your hand. When we started out with electronics, electricity, we worked in the analog world. 
We had scanning going across the tube. And guess what everything changed into um, in the last 20 or 30 years? Digital. Now, you know how digital works? They're all dots and dashes and particles. They're all in spurts. They're not waves. They're waves of things and we interpret them. We sent out a pattern across a fiber optic, literally pulses. That's how we see everything today. That's how you're seeing this video. That's how our, our, our what works. We're in a digital age. Particles can do the same thing and describe everything in the universe in the same way, information wise. There's some problems with the ether stuff is, how do you have this bashing together? How do you have the bashing together, those who are etherists? Oh, wait a minute, oh, here we go. Here's a more uh, accurate version of what we think is really happening in the particle model. See right there? Oh, I... What you see there look like, like blotches each one of those blotches are actually groups of particles, groups of particles that are being released. And that's, that's what we really think is going on. But here's, here's one for etherists, okay? I have it in here. I saw it. Here we go. All you etherists, you got a problem. And I'm going to show it to you right now. All those people, that's got to be an ether. This is our version of the particle model, what a, what a laser is. We have no problem in our particle model of sending light waves that don't disperse very much. They're going to disperse, eventually they will. But the way waves work is if you have something, uh, uh, send out a sound, you can sort of focus it a little bit, but it's gonna spread. So you have a real problem with, with things like lasers, which can go quite a long t distance. They spread out, but quite a long ways. Um, and people go nuts. How does a wave in an ether do that? It doesn't. It can't. So. I have been extremely stubborn in describing everything in particles by I am a, an ether convert. Cool. It's a game. We're going at it. We're going to be coming out with our book. And um, people who aren't, I guess, people who don't get ether on the brain, which I call it, uh, because I don't have it, ether on the brain. Um, ether, I understand. I like the model. Uh, it does a lot of good things, but it fails too many th places. And um, a lattice is a very good model as well. And uh, if you hold on to a model and say, I'm an etherist and you're a diehard etherist, you are going to, like the mainstream, say to yourself, then this is the right way. The reason my father and I continue with the particle model is because we continue to be able to describe things that we thought were not describable, like the double slit experiment with the detector and why it changes from, looks like it changes from a wave to particle. Uh, we actually have an explanation that we, our, our particle models being, it has extremely good explanatory power. Now, is it right? We're not saying it's right. My father and I are always saying it could be all baloney, but it's, it's descriptive power. So be careful, all of you, no matter what, when you subscribe to, you better understand very well what its limitations are. And that's what ethers do not do. They go, whoop, and then they go, I'm going to describe everything with it. I'm going, ether, this is just a thing to remember, Remember, Steve, listen to this. Ether is by, de not definition, by design made to describe light as waves through a medium. That's what it is. It's not gravity. It's not electricity. It's not any of those things. It's not magnetic fields. Now, people who do do ether say they can do that. Gravity is um, <clears throat> the density of ether and it's just the sort of Brownian motion for it. Um, it, it. Who's got one of the better models with ether is Dr. Glenn Borkert. Um, magnetic fields are, are flows in the ether. You know, that's shown by <coughs> uh, Yonel Dunu. 
He has a very simple ether theory. But you have to make sure, you have to understand, it is a model specifically for light. Particles are not. Particles aren't for gravity. They're not for anything. They're just, it's mass and movement and kinetic energy. That's it. But ether, you are saying that I, you are taking a model that's specific for light, and then after people fall in love with it, they go, how can I get gravity into there? How can I get this into that? So, got to just understand that. You got to understand that. What is ether? It's simply a medium of light travels in. Uh huh. All the other particles are disturbances in the ether. Well, that is a model. <coughs> um, that's uh, Jeff Yee has a model just like that too, for sure. And again, I am all for you guys. If you have your model and you're thinking of it, that's right. I am here as your science therapist to make sure you understand that when I, for instance, who'm not an etherist, um, <coughs> that we exist. And that we understand the, 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 how do you say, the, the uh, weaknesses of the ether theories, okay? You have to understand those. And I know a lot of ether theorists who don't care to worry about it. They try to solve it. Uh, transverse waves. And uh, uh, the way... Um, and transverse waves has to do with dispersion. Why why you have light white light go into rainbows? Well, problem with this is ether that you have you, you can't really find you need transverseness to do that. And the only way they can do tra you know, he uh, it says they're um Borkert says they're like galaxies, and so they actually can do this. So uh, particles can be like so the waves can also be transverse versus this way. Uh, so it's the shape he's saying of the particles but the way I look at it is you're trying to fit a I'm going to be very specific about one thing in the universe that's light I'm never going to call it an ether and then I'm going to try to fit everything else into it I don't like that idea I don't that's why I'm not an ether it's like uh, you've got it's like saying okay I am um, I've got uh, an idea that uh, I need to describe why um, there's this uh, a fog in this in this room and the way it works. And so you come up with what that kind of okay. This is why this fog is and the way it moves and all that. But now I'm going to fit everything else into it. The lights in the room that's there here, the heat in the room that's here, uh, the uh, different chemicals, the pressure. I'm going to describe it all with this idea. You know. I, ether, in my opinion, is a small solution to one problem, and when you do that, you fall into the trap that it's not going to—it's going to have its problems because it's too brittle. Just be aware of that. Maybe you know. I think some people think if somebody's going to come along, and it can't happen. Look at look. I'm not a person that says that can't happen. I am very different from everybody else. I'm not a good science evangelist. If someone says, David, could ether be right? Well, 90% of the people say it's going to, be, they, they think it's right. 90% of the distance say that's the way it's going. Could it be? Yeah. Maybe one person will come along and crack the code. You know, I, I don't believe in savior mode either. It's a whole nother argument, but absolutely. So Steve, if you, I'm Steve Beck. If you have a theory about this I'd, and you have your own uh, work on that, be happy to look at it. I'm just trying to point out Every time, the, you know, every time I talk to says, oh, I'm an ether. I, I'm not heard of any. Uh, well, we have people who uh, aren't. How do you say? They don't. I don't know. You know why they're not. They don't have ether in the brain. And then when they there are some people who like our model. Not not very not as many <laughs> nearly as uh, other uh, ether people for sure. Um, it's simply a matter of it. The mainstream uses quantum fields. They are just ethers without the name. Um, I'll disagree with that uh, uh, pretty strongly. Uh, the reason is, is because you're talking about people who are so far off and at the very foundations that, you know, I say, clear the board, start over, keep those ideas in mind, but let's start over. So this whole thing about, because you have to buy everything else. So, you you know, for, the, for you to say, for instance, space-time, well, space-time bends, oh, that's ether. 
No, it's not. Even the mainstream people in, and the people who are etherists in our group who have been etherists for a while are going to say, no, it's not. It's, it's a different thing. It's a different model. There is no model of space-time. Space-time is a mathematical thing. There's no physicality to it. So, And you can't say that we're putting physicality to it because space-time says light is bent by gravity. NASA scientist Edward Dowdy says, no, it's not. And so you have a, a split between uh, people in the dissident community saying, oh, my, my model shows why light uh, gravity bends light. And I said, well, my, our model shows why it doesn't because it doesn't. It's not that we want it, we, it can show it. It's not, that's not what's happening. That's not what we see. So, I mean, the electron coming out of copper, oh, let's see, mainstream uses quantum fields. I meant the electron coming out of copper plate is how we know there are a certain amount of light has hit the plate. Yeah, I mean, you have, you, have, you know, um, uh, you shoot a bullet. A bullet is a bunch of atoms holding hands, right? Well, and those have a mass, and they're going at a certain speed. It's not one thing. It's never one thing. Even a particle isn't one thing. And of course, yeah, if you want to imbue it with lots of, you know, uh, magical powers, you can do it like particle physics does. Then you know you can build a universe out of it. But yeah, absolutely, that's that's true. Um, the electron coming out of a copper plate is somehow a, a, and yeah depends on your model all depends on your model how can a mag uh, magnetosphere of the earth and other planets work using particles um that's because they're flowing particles it's just flow it's just like you know the news um get our i wrote a paper on that in our um proceedings can't remember which one. 2017. Let's see. Yeah, it's no, 2016. I wrote a paper on that. I got a diagram I can show you. I wrote a paper on it. You guys should come to our meeting, our, our conferences. And this comes from a paper that was actually inspired by Robert Berger. It's entitled, Physical Explanation for a Greater Earth uh, ex Expansion in the Southern Hemisphere. I believe I have this online. You can go online and see it. Let me see. It's in our wiki.naturalphilosophy.org. Um, we need to put all of our papers in here, but um, uh, Hilster, I'll just put my name in it. Uh, we have uh, 10,000 pages in our Wikipedia, and um, there we go. Okay, let's see if we can find this. Here's our Wikipedia. We have uh, people who are scientists in our Wikipedia, or those of us working in the field. Uh, external links, extracts, um, expand, Earth expansion major objections solved. That was one of them, no. Okay, physical estimation for greater Earth expansion in the southern hemisphere. This is to answer the question, how does a magnetic sphere, a magnetosphere of the Earth and other planets using particles? Easy answer for all. Okay, and I'll click on this, and here it is. Um, if you go to wiki.naturalphilosophy.org, search for De Hilster, then go down uh, to my paper. Um, we try to recreate these papers, and there is the explanation. In fact, Dr. James Maxlow, uh, there's not, we're not the only ones to come up with these ideas. Um, uh, they've been independently discovered, especially for the expanding Earth. Uh, so this describes quite a lot of stuff in one diagram here, but basically the sun blows apart atoms um, and this is, a, again, a diagram, folks. They're, they're not traveling in lines like this. Uh, but they get sh thrown out, and these represent G1 particles, or what we call whatever goes around the nucleus, whatever you want to call it. All right, electron, let's keep the mainstream. So that's a nucleon, a proton. We're going to call it a proton, an electron. I don't like them because charge is a arbitrary thing. It's stupid. It's not. Nah. Okay, anyways, and so you have flows. So the G1 particles are flowing around. 
the difference between light and gravity is G1, uh, G1 particles that are flowing around in a, in a flow around the Earth. Um, things, magnetic elect, electro, uh, electric universe and magnetic uh, are particles that flow together. So anything that in the universe, according to our model, is uh, that's the way I, we describe what's electric of the universe. Electric is simply similar particles all flowing together. And they will flow together, and if they flow together, two flows meet each other, they will, in the same direction, they're flowing like this, which are opposite in their twirl, they will attract, and we know why physically that would happen, and this is the yonel Denou effect, the Denou effect, I call it. And so what happens is the any magnetic field are particles going around, they get caught up, and when they're going, in fact, I've got a question into James Maxwell. It says, James Maxwell, I have an interesting question. According to our model, the reason the, the Southern Hemisphere has more, uh, uh, has more uh, expansion going on, which it does, the Southern Hemisphere has expanded more. If you take a globe, um, shoot, where did I put my globe? I've got a globe somewhere. Uh, I'll use this one. The problem is you can't see the, the. Uh, <laughs> but on the globe, if you take along, when I was a kid, I used to turn it upside down because look, there's hardly any land there. And then I turn it right, uh, the north side, and there's all the land. Why does that happen? Well, our contention is is that the flow of G1 particles are entering the South Pole. When they enter the South Pole, they're going to have more electrons and nucleons sucked up into the south side of the Earth more than the north. So I asked James Maxwell, do we have any information about how often it's the, the it's flipped, north and, pole, and south pole flipped, because the direction of those particle flows are going to be in opposite directions. I mean, in, in you know, in one direction right now, they're going inside the, the south pole and coming out the north pole. So if, if we have that kind of thing, well, it's not exactly in, in, in that way. And it's actually not that we're finding out and we know that it's not that simple. And yeah, we know the flows, yeah, it's not gonna be perfect. And, and it really has more to do with the rotation of the earth that why that they are in this shape and not all over the place like the sun. The sun has them you know, all over the place. But anyways, that's how we think. These are flows of particles. That's what, that's what oh, you would say. And um, if it flips, if we find out geolo geological record over the last millions and millions of years show that it's been mostly in the position it is now, and let's say a certain percentage, that percentage should reflect the expansion difference from the South and the North Pole. And voila, that was what this paper was all about physical explanation for a greater expansion on the southern hemisphere and I wrote it again with uh, Robert Berger because he was the one who came up because he actually likes and subscribes for a model in fact if you look at this look at all the the um, land there which one has more <laughs> so that's our our contention so that I hope they answer that's that and that's available for anybody to see so many gems out there no one knows about. I should do a, a talk on that. Um, here we go. Mainstream uses quantum fields. Da, da, da. How can the magnets... Okay, okay. I'm not cool with it. I am really depressed. What you're not cool with? Why are you really depressed? He's gone away. Have you gone away, Steve? Or are you still here? What are you depressed about? It's not cool with it. Let's see. Let, let's read it back for mainstream uses quantum fields. Blah blah blah. Uh, I meant the electron coming out of the copper field. How can the magnetic sphere of the Earth and other using particles? Okay, I'm not cool with it. I am really depressed. Well, I'm not sure what that means, but um, illuminous Socrates. Oh, okay. We've got, I believe, um, the guy I can't remember his name. Dissident Science recommended channel. Uh, Robert Ritchie, electrical engineer. Oh, cool. I'll take a look at it, see if I can find that there. Robert Ritchie. Oh, was, I may have taken electrical engineer.
I just gotta let me see here. Uh, I can't get to it. Okay. I'd have to go and do that. I can't do that on the same computer, but maybe I can take a look at that. The ether still here. Oh, okay. So I'm not cool with it. I'm really depressed. Okay, so you're you're not cool with it and really depressed about the ether after I said those things. Oh, don't be that way. Uh, solve it. <laughs> I, I think I think here's what I would say. I, I I get in trouble all the time with my own group. I'm so I call myself the dissident of the dissidents because I will not even with my friends and and really great models which I really like I will still be brutally honest with them because why am I going to tell you or anybody else that that's really cool if you are deciding like well I'm sort of leaning through ethers okay but since you are you need to know about this these things and what I see with etherist is where I, I got I got sort of an answer to this Steve um, if I go back 20 years when I first got involved with these people, um, I was in my 30s and early 40s, I, I noticed they were much more careful than they are today. This is very similar to the string theory, where etherists knew, I mean, this dissidents knew where ether had its problems and it couldn't describe certain things. In fact, mainstream science tells us it's not even the, the dissidents. So we have to understand that the mainstream scientists, they are the ones telling us what, what, where ether fails. Now, there's two things that can happen. One, we either have to give explanations to those things, or we're going to have to say, maybe I need to look at a different model. And what happens today is, since we can throw everything away and people are more comfortable with that, and that is super I am all for that. That people, when they throw it all away, they're going to say, okay, what is this? Well, it's a wave, 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 it's a wave. It's a wave. It's a wave. It, wave has to be something. It's got to be physical. And that's what Glenn Borkert says. And he's right. You cannot have force in the universe like magnetic force without something really pushing it. It's got to be a mass. So that's why we have the particle model. Everything, every force in the universe is a mass and it's pushing something. And you can make the whole universe out of that, supposedly. And that's what we're trying to do. Whereas with people are seduced by waves in a medium. Because we have sound waves. We have water waves. And so our psyche, our brains are wired to say, that's what a wave is. Yet, electronics used waves in analog before analog analog they were not using digital information movies were analog because they were film the film got scratched we said how can we preserve information without it losing any degradation we turned digital the particle model is digital the waves that my father came up with for the wave particle duality solution were waves of particles all traveling together now it isn't as intuitive i myself who know the particle model one of the two most intimate people on, on earth in the sense of their intimate knowledge of the particle model my, my dad and i since very few of us care about it <laughs> see that's the thing about <laughs> You can tell I've got no ego with this. Because otherwise I'd be so upset that no one likes my model. They're all etherists. But the whole thing is, is that when you understand that you can send all information, that the whole universe are forces and that they forces are just what we call particles. They may be complicated. It may look like this. This is a particle. If I make a bunch of these, like... Uh, Borkert says if ethers like this he says he can explain transverse waves regardless so you, 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 I don't make I'm not here to make you anybody depressed I'm here to make sure you do not get seduced because the people 
20 years ago in our group weren't seduced and lots of them were not etherists because they go you got too many problems now we seem to be like string theory it was all made up and the people who made it up are horrified that today there are string theorists and they have conventions with that and actually mainstream physics is starting to push back at string theory they're actually starting to say oh it's a little too far so i'm just saying i've seen it just like in artificial intelligence i started that in the 1980s and we have become we have come close to the singularity in the 1980s and then we are around 2000 with the internet we were supposed to get the singularity and now we're again getting the singularity it's every 20 years we get the singularity and artificial intelligence and ro intelligent robots will be here they haven't come to us yet and we had those of us who've been around a while know why it's just another generation comes in either they're waves i'm going to solve it they all go it and they all have the same problem because they're not listening to it so steve Here's what I would say to you. If you do like the ether theory, don't get depressed. Get to work. Hey, that's pretty cool. Don't get depressed. Get to work. Solve those problems. Don't be afraid to tackle them. Because two things are going to happen. Either you're going to reject ether because you're going to say this just, it's just, in my opinion, like what my opinion is, it's too specific of a, of a, of a model to be, in my, my, my opinion, a good model for the universe. It may work a little for 80% of light problems, but that may be all. Or, as some people are looking for, the Savior will come down from high. And I'm not saying you are not that, because you could. Steve Beck, you could come across uh, uh, an ether theory that could be the one. See, that's what's different with me, folks. It can happen. I could be completely wrong on ether. And so go at it. But I'm going to tell you, um, I've been around a while, and, and many of us aren't either. It's because we, we see those problems. And that's why I got so excited about my dad's uh, wave particle solution. I literally went nuts and, and, and walked around like a, a madman for a half an hour, mumbling to myself when my dad came up with that. Because I had seen ether theories for 25 years. And I had no theory of my own, or my father didn't either. And then what I saw, what he saw, and I know that somebody, Roger Ryden, one of the people in our group who've been around for 20 years as well, brilliant guy, I think he's a nuclear chemist, he is in our group. He had talked about like something like this, I heard. But no one ever formalized it the way we have, or, or applied it, so. Alrighty, uh, I will take a look at Robert Ritchie. Um, hey, uh, Luminati Socrates, please send me that link if you can. Um, it's good to be brutally honest with models. If, if the models are on right track, criticism can strengthen it or motivate research to answer apparent problems. Absolutely. You got it, Steve. String theory is an embarrassment. <laughs> no, it isn't. It's, well, yeah, no, it's not. Human beings are an embarrassment. I got to write that one down. I've got to start getting a piece of paper and writing all these ideas for talks, which I don't have enough time on. What I need is like a millionaire. Hey, uh, any of you uh, people that have been hanging out here, if you're a millionaire and you want to sponsor somebody to really get science moving along, not because I have the answers, but it can help that. Uh, but um, yeah, the string theory. Well, the problem with the string theory is uh, not the string theory. It's, it's people not wrong people are why is that well the people who came up with the string theory stated from the very beginning that it was it was um, a theory that was completely bogus they said it. it says we're making this up we're going to try to come up with a one-dimensional thing which they said this is a joke and what happened is in the early 1990s when I lived in uh, a Los Angeles area, I saw somebody from Caltech who was one of the original string theorists who had an interview either on TV or was in an in a article, which I cannot find. I cannot get and find that. I don't know if they purged it uh, or they don't care or they didn't record it or at that time they just didn't keep, uh, keep it. But the, string, the guy, one of the very original guys that came up with string theory, says, I am horrified. We came up with this idea, and now people are treating it as real. So, 
Is it the string theory's fault? No. The people who made the string theory, it's not their fault. It's the fault of people who fall in love, who want to come up with magical things. These people, the nerds who want to be loved, they want to go out there and pretend that they're really smart, they're intellectuals. And intellectual to me is a, deg I, I have made that into a negative term. Critical thinker is the good term. Uh, intellectual is a person who thinks they're intelligent, intellectual, and they want to show others people that. They're not interested in being right or wrong or finding a good model or a bad model. So the problem isn't the string theory. It's we human beings that take something that was obviously told to us, that is obviously uh, a make-believe unicorn world, and try to use it. And so you got you got Neil deGrasse Tyson going on CN, you know, CNN or any of the mainstream anywhere, um, Discovery Channel, whatever you want, it, whatever the Science Channel, and saying, well, you know, we have Newton, but that Newton breaks down uh, when you have the Big Bang and black holes, and then Einstein, then a second, he's the next guy, but then he breaks down at the very beginning of the Big Bang and in the middle of the very middle of black holes or in the front, of the and in string theory, it looks like it's going to solve that. <sighs> Shoot me now. Just shoot me now. I almost tripped that guy. <laughs> Sorry, I keep saying that. I should have just for the human, for all of us who love science. It should. It would have been a trip heard around the universe. Super symmetry too. See my dissident science super symmetry. Um, there's two of those, I think. One, I talk about it uh, by myself on Unsucker's work and Unsucker, one of our interviews about supersymmetry. Oh, hey, hey go to uh, the Machian. Uh, when I started my channel, um, uh, I, I, I always say I take credit for it. I think it's part of it because I, I push Alexander Unsucker because he's a great guy. I, I love his, his work and his, his guts, his gutsiness to go out there. But uh, he only had 300 and... Uh, 80 subscribers in eight years and since I started doing my channel and I started pushing his channel uh, he has gone from 380 to over a thousand he's almost quadrupled it in two years what he had in the first whatever and I know it does accumulate uh, but um, uh, it's great to see those things growing that's my whole purpose is the yeah Steve you know Get out there, do that. Yeah, I agree. Humans are we're embarrassing. Yeah, I if, if aliens came down here, I says I please forgive us. Believe me, there's some of us who understand our sign the collider that we built and why we did it and what we came up with. Don't look at it. Don't judge us by that because it's so. They're gonna they would laugh. They're gonna probably go back to the planet. You can see these guys. They invented these things called quarks. They said it was one particle, but it isn't one particle. It's six, and they've got all these arbitrary things. It's, it'd be like us looking back at the primitiveness of the technology of people 100,000 years ago and laughing at it. The link I dropped above, nice explanation, fits with my idea. Oh, cool. Good. Uh, yeah, I agree with him. Yep, yep. Uh, Richie, Robert Richie. Okay. Hello, Lambda. Hello. I guess people are jumping in and out, of course. Uh, global warming is also embarrassing. Agenda political science is not science. Yeah, um, the truth of the matter is, is we need to have an open debate about all of these things. Um, the only thing I can say is we are destroying the planet. That's true. I try to get people to say when I, uh, I'm a progressive politically. Again, I have friends who are conservative creationists and I am great dear friends with them so I am not a person that judges people we all should be able to live together and believe what we want but we should all do science in a way that science science and then we do in the CMPS we have people who are atheists people who are Christians people who think the earth's 12,000 years old no one does their science papers saying that this is the earth's 12,000 years old or 50 billion years old what we all do is we talk about scientific stuff 
We don't care. What I say is we don't care where your inspiration comes, whether it's from a religion or something, or if it's wherever it's from. We don't care. But just, you know, let's just look at the science and uh, all get along. And yeah, um, the way I'm, I'm going to be doing it in the future, within the year, I'm, I'm going to be launching another website that's going to be more biased toward the progressive side. But I'm going to hammer on the progressives and those people who are are pushing uh, are what I call science Nazis. I said, look, let's change the shift, the thing from global warming to destruction of the earth, because that is happening. We have, we, we, we raise animals, the crap goes into the ocean and it's creating large dead zones. We know this. There were coral. I, I live here in Florida. I went snorkeling for the first time off the coast with a friend of mine who took us and uh, the coral is dead. And it's not the temperature that's doing it. It's chemicals. So, um, you know, it's not global warming. We, we're destroying the earth. We got, That we don't want to do. And that we know we can do. So, yeah. Um, climate change may be real, but the stereo about its cringe worthy. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you 100%, Steve, on that. We are destroying the part of, uh, planet with particle accelerators. What? Windmills and solar panels. Okay, I'm not sure I followed that, but hey, if you have science to back it up. Anyways, um, where are we today? Oh, 10.30, my goodness. We are usually, um, I go max two hours. Uh, I appreciate all the comments, and I appreciate people coming by. I know I see Lambda's here. Um, if you have any questions, you know, let me know, because eventually, I mean, I can keep talking, but... Um, I'd rather be guided by, you know, sort of people that are here because that's sort of the uh, interesting thing. Because when I make a video, I don't always answer people's questions. So that's the idea. So I appreciate all you guys subscribing, letting other people too. And, and if you have your own channel, let me know. Um, but anyways, if we go back to what the theme is tonight, let me see here. Uh, we are definitely a majority. Um, it's really, really, really... Oh, <laughs> I see. That was a joke. All right, I got you. Sorry about that. <laughs> well, particle accelerators are destroying the human mind. That's what those are doing. Uh, and oh, oh, there's here's an interesting thing. One of the things my mentor, Dr. Uh, Ricardo Carazzani, brilliant man, said, he said he, he really hated to see all these brilliant minds and these particle accelerators being wasted and it sort of goes with the theme i'm talking about tonight i don't think that's what's happening those aren't the most brilliant minds we have the most brilliant minds we have are the dissidents and the critical thinkers that we are talking about those are the most brilliant minds the other people and the other brilliant minds are not in physics and they're laughing at it with nowhere to go and that's why i think like the channel like one of my subscribers said this should have a million viewers it should have a million subscribers not because i'm doing anything it's not me it's just that i am talking about the real science and i'm talking about how the you know i'm not the only one a lot of people who have i know illuminati has his channel talks about magnetism for instance and how that's you know a big force of the universe you know there's a lot of people talking about their own thing you know their own work or you know a bent of a theory like the electric universe or looking at us well they say everything, but I look at a specific thing. I myself is different in that I will tell you everybody's models. I will tell you that they all should have, they all have the right, and I will tell you to go at it. And I, if I, if you want to forego and say, okay, I know that these are problems, but I still want to solve this. How can I solve it? I will be happy to give you my opin opinion on that. So um, when we, t when we're looking about, um, uh, you know all these brilliant people in particle physics, all these astrophysicists, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson is brilliant mind. No, he's not. I'm sorry, he is not. And not because I don't think he's dumb. He's not dumb, but he, he just parrots. He, he, he learns things and he makes certain connections and he, he likes to be philosophical and, and that kind of stuff and be sort of entertaining, make your brain be tickled and all that stuff. But anybody can do that. No offense, anybody can. You can look up stuff, you can write down stuff, you can find things that are interesting, you can make a YouTube channel and fine. He just happened to be an astrophysicist who's actually not that good. If you look up his stuff, he didn't win the Nobel Prize, as we say. But of course, the Nobel Prize 
isn't a, is anything that to hold up f for. But the idea that my mentor said, um, Dr. Ricardo Carrozzani said to me, David, um, uh, you know, I hate to see the wasted, all these brilliant minds. Nope, you're not seeing brilliant minds wasted. You're seeing mediocre minds who go along, capitulate, who perpetuate um, uh, illogical stuff, pretend to know about it, pre to hide in their university towers, and in all of them, the thousands and thousands of them around the world, there are not millions of them, there are only thousands of them, and those people in their ivory towers will protect themselves, get their monies for, from big uh, you know, politicians who are afraid that they want to get the next atomic bomb, whatever that will be produced, and so they throw money that way and pretend to be interested in science, which they're not, and all those things go on and on and on and on. But they're not the brilliant people. The brilliant people are outside. They're outside the uh, mainstream. Always have been. Mainstream is not the place where they they are. Uh, I take a look at the uh, Democrats' Green New Deal and show why it both scientifically baseless and based on every irrational, dangerous thinking. I don't, you know, we, I don't want to get into politics on this channel. Um, I am going to have a channel that I will get into science and politics, um, but mostly lo trying to look at truth again. You know, like diet. There's, there's, I mean, I'm on a whole plant-based diet, but I study. I read the China study. You know, uh, I have on my website, which is a, a website that I'm going to be launching after we get Science Woke Up. You know, uh, everybody has their, oh, this diet, you know, that. No, uh, there are scientific studies, and there's only one diet and it wasn't invented, it was discovered because people were living so long and they didn't know why and they discovered why. There's only one diet that has cl been clinically shown to reverse chronic diseases. People need to know that. Of course, they don't want to know it because people who are on my diet, who are healthy, are producing animals and dairy and all this other stuff that kill people and then they invest in that and they invest in pharmacies, f a big pharma so they can give you all those things on TV and all you have to do is change your diet and as Bill Gates showed in 2010 the number one killer in the United States as a fact a statistical fact in 2010 paid by the Gates uh, uh, Foundation number two is smoking number one diet so yeah um, I'm going to do a channel on that but you got to be really careful um, you know to take a, a, a stance Again, we are destroying the planet. We can discuss what is doing that. We know a, a numbers of things that are doing that. The chemicals that we use uh, to kill insects on plants is one little part of it. The bigger part is all the, the, the little literal crap that comes uh, from all the animal husbandry that washes down into our oceans and makes huge dead zones. It's not global warming. But we have to discuss it. We have to shift our views to the destruction of the planet, which we are doing very well at right now. What is going to happen, it could go into an ice age. It may not go into global warming. I don't know. We can only predict weather till 10 days, more or less. So I don't want to get into that. Um, that will be for my other channel, but not this one here. Thoughts on how light propagates um, through an ether made of, uh, ha, ha, ha. Uh, boy, that's a subtle, a unicorn uh, uh, urination piss, huh? Well, uh, I would say you should think about the propagation of, well, right now the propagation happens in four ways. One's magical and that's mainstream science. They have, they have nothing, they don't have anything. It's math. So it's magic. So magic is one way. Um, ether is the most popular way because we, we want to think that waves, we have a tendency in our physical world to see waves in mediums. That's the way we experience them. We can't imagine that they were something else. So that's the most popular. My, my opinion, emotionally, that's why. Because we have other ones. Particle model is another one, uh, started in 2015 only, but it is another way to look at light and of course you have lattice models which are actually the newest one's a particle model uh ether is the oldest and lattice model is the second oldest 
And so those are the, and magic. So those are the four ways that I can see. I'm not sure that you can see. The ether and lattice are similar in that, that the, uh, they're th the wave through another thing, that the thing itself, the wave itself is a force that's transmitted uh, uh, from one thing to another. So um, those are really the only ways. I can't think of any other way. Lambda, I think a couple of uh, torsional longitudinal impulses uh, affect a mass along the path, thus making it act like a bouncy particle, not a transverse wave. Lambda, I think light is a coupling of torsional and longitudinal impulses that induce an effective mass along the path. Yeah, there's a lot of terminology, and I know you have a lot of terminology. And um, I think the only thing I would say, Illuminati, because I know who you are, and uh, congratulations on your work. I'm a big fan, so cool. But I would say, if you can, work on trying, you know, because we can describe the particle model or even the ether model in colloquial terms. You don't need any fancy words. You need to untangle those and get it so you can. Because what's gonna happen is you're gonna have the same reaction as people have with mainstream science, which is they put all these terminology out. You end up talking 90% about terminology and people aren't even getting the model. So I think I would untangle your terminology and try to make it colloquial, okay? I don't mean you have to have grandma understand it, but you know, otherwise people, it's gonna be a barrier. And those people, it's going to be like almost, you end up making a cult when you have to put new words and things that are going, because why? Because you're, you will be speaking a speak that no one else speaks. I'm going to learn that. I'm going to now feel uh, uh, that connection. That connection makes me feel special and feeling special about what you are doing. A bad idea because we humans, egos will get in the way. And what will happen, I will take a look at your model. If, if it turns out that uh, another model is right, or I'll take a look at your model, see this good thing, this good thing, I can use that, put it into my model, and go on. And you're going to say, you stole that from me. I said, well, yeah, that's okay, but you're stuck over there because you are you may be in this world of yours talking about in term, a lot of time in the terminology and not working on the actual thing. It's my suggestion. If you want people new, like even myself, because I've I watched some of your videos and I am enough about that I can understand the terminology, torsion. I know what that is, longitudinal impulses I do. Induce, I know what that is. Infective mass, I, I get an idea what that is along the path. This is making a bouncy like particle. I get the idea, but I think you need to you know, the average person here who read, read it and who doesn't know your work and hasn't looked at it, it's going to take them some time to untangle that. I understand you're trying to be precise in your words, but I'm trying to say to you that if you want to be um, understood easier, when I explain to somebody a picture of the way our light model works, I say they're waves of particles. <laughs> People get that. And then I show them the picture of the bombers. Oh, I get that. I don't need some weirdo. No, weirdo. Sorry. <laughs> some different terminology. Please strike that from me. Like I said, I, I really am a fan of your work. I'm only saying to you what I would say in your getting it to understand. Because when you have it precise in the way your terminology, you have a glossary in the back of your book, that's great. But when you're coming out into a public, they're going to look at it as sort of like when you hear somebody and you go to a religious or a new age place and they have their terminology. You feel a part of it or you feel not a part of it. That's what I'm saying. So you want to try to make what you you have condensed down as a terminology like consuponable and either teach people. What I do is if I say the word consuponable, which I will, 
I will say that means to be self-consistent. That is, all the rules you have in your system have to be consuponable. Why do you have that world? They have to be self-consistent. That is, you have six rules, but two of them contradict each other. What is a non-consuponable um, model? Special relativity. It says everything has to be the same in the universe, but it's each frame has its own stuff in the in the in the rules in each frame is the same but if you move faster one frame compared to another time slows down or mass increases all of a sudden it ain't the same so you have it is not consuponable but when i say it i explain it so if you got a sentence where you're saying it very clearly in your mind i can sort of untangle it enough that i know and i've seen enough of this stuff that maybe i could with some time sort of interpret it i know uh dr karazani had a real problem uh with explaining what his stuff was he couldn't yeah i i was the one who seven years later can explain dr karazani's work which is there are no frames in the universe. There's only a three-dimensional space. The most you can do is put an origin somewhere and measure something that's happening from that origin. There is no such thing as this origin being measured through this origin and then measuring it to that, and that becomes relativity. That's what he said. There's only one three-dimensional space, and there's only there's only uh, actions that happen. If you want to have any any observer to any relationship, that is a one-to-one -one thing. It has nothing to do with the guy next to you. Uh, but it took me a long time to get that. So the description of those particles, as you were saying, which are longitudinal, etc., the longitudinal impulses that induce an effective mass, basically I would say, okay, um, what Illuminati is saying is that you have an ether... And, and there is a, 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 let's see, a coupling of torsional and longitudinal impulses that is, uh, well, I don't know, torsional impulses? Okay, now I'm starting to say, now I'm actually looking at that one. The rest of it, I get it, but the, long, the longitudinal impulse I get, but torsional? Yeah, you see, you'd have to explain that to me. But anyways, no criticism. I'm just trying to point out something that we have learned in, one of the, the reason I'm harping on this is because we went through a period of probably 15 years in our organization and doing our proceedings, proceedings have been around for over 20 years. We spent so much time on arguments between, amongst ourselves that we were talking around, above, through each other because we had our own terminology and we couldn't we were talking we thought we were talking different things and sometimes we were talking identically so uh question was what is energy energy is a concept it's not a real thing energy if you were to give if i were to give my definition of energy it's the potential of doing work what we call as humans energy, because I'm looking at it, energy as what we would say in uh, our world of, um, let me get out of some of these here, because um, my computer's slowing down. Energy is something that we have mass, for instance, that we put in our gas tank, and we expect to get something from it. This is so much energy. We capture uh, the kinetic energy from sunlight, and we expect so much work we can get out of that we have a way and, it, and that work can be energy in fact has a myriad of units so there you go and what we have to then try to do is match what those mu those units mean from one energy unit to another that's because what we are trying to do in the end energy exists because we want to do useful things with the universe using our knowledge of how the universe works. We don't want to have to, because of our beings, make our own food, plan our own food, I mean, plan our own food, gather our food, make, make stuff out of it, and serve it on the table. We would rather just show up and have it there so we can think great thoughts. But to do those things, we need to have things happen and this thing of needing energy we need to get movement we can make a very complicated machine to do the movements we want but we gotta harness 
where that motion comes from and that's what we call in general energy and so that's the way I would put it and I think it's a very modern view of what it is but it is not anything it is a concept and it's a useful concept but it you can't say give me three energies you can't energy isn't a thing the last model is like how sound works in a condensed matter yep yeah, very good Steve Beck I agree with you uh, phonons are sound uh, quasi particles and they are lattice vibrations okay how do you view space the place where everything exists okay this is a good question uh, Farouk hey I think I know a Farouk maybe you are the Farouk that I do know um, and um, so um, I'm gonna get to uh, Google the terms well, I've got an answer to that one. Um, this is what I would say on space, Farouk. What it is, I believe in infinity. I do not believe there is a single particle. You can never have a single particle makes the universe work because I don't believe in magical particles. I don't believe that there's a particle that can organize itself from randomness and it's all the same particle. I believe all particles are different. They're very, very similar, but they're, they're different. And because of that, if you look, and I've, I've gone through this before, and so bear with me, but it probably is good for you to understand at least this concept, whether you agree with it or not, is this it looks like a solid object. It looks like a particle. If I get really far away from it and look at it, it looks like a little teeny particle. Can, this is really the Earth. That looks like a particle, whatever. But this is made up of other things. If you ask a physicist how much, uh, if I shoot a very small particle through this, will it go through that? Yep. Radio waves go through it. Well, G1 particles go through it. Electrons can go through this. Uh, protons, not so much, but there's a lot of space in there. In the, in the uh, in an atom, the nucleus is where the, uh, most of the stuff is, and you have something going around it. So if that's the case, my fingers touching this well where is it stopping because if you look at this 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 thing it's mostly space if you look at this is mostly space what's happening the nucleons are hitting okay let's say the nucleons are hitting the nucleons of our atoms are hitting so they can't go through um, well what's a nucleon well a nucleon is a particle like this and a nucleon is made up of smaller particles so the nucleon has got a lot of space in it and so when you have a nucleon hit a nucleon it's going to be like anything. So the rule, the whole thing is about infinity is you can never find mass and you can never find space. You can only in your, our range of the world, the, the unicosm, the microcosm of where we are, like in my father and I's model, we have infinity model. We can describe most of everything in the universe with the G, the level one and level two. We have, we, we have gone down to level three, but just a little bit. Level one and level two will describe and probably get us to the point where we can do, especially level two, can do a lot more technologically than we can now. But the thing is about space, if you are a person who believes in Borkert, the way I put it, and this is my own words, um, that their space is neither empty and mass is neither empty. Total, uh, space is neither totally empty and mass is ne and neither totally solid and so if you go to find it you'll never find it you'll never find the mass and you'll never find the space you'll find well you, f you think you find space but then when you get in the space you find that no even I mean look I mean I'm waving around here to me if you ask a kid is there anything here no this is space there's nothing there and then I blow them and I go what's that oh there is oxygen and all carbon all this stuff there's atoms floating around and we go into space space and it's like no there's nothing there well there's light going through and that's a force and it's burning through my uh, by magnified it's gonna burn through my spacesuit and so the answer to what is space it is the place where mass is and what is mass there's space in it with mass other smaller parts in it so you never get to one or the other space is not empty mass is not solid anywhere so 
it's it's uncomfortable but it's a lot less comfortable than the idea that there's one particle that makes everything and it's infinitely dense because if you have a particle that has no parts i have a talk on this in one of the conferences let's say this is the ultimate particle that everything's made out of it there's no hole in it because you can't if there's a hole in it and there's even a sh sort of a shape to it it's going to be made of something else so it has to be infinitely dense because i should not be able to find space in here so if I find space in here, it's made of smaller parts. That's by definition. So. Uh, this is science. I'm trying to be precise in my words. Yep, that's fine. Just look up Bill Gade. He's right in that sense. Absolutely, you should be precise. The whole thing I'm saying is, if you want people who are outsiders to understand, you you know what you say, and, and I'm. I'm not arguing that you're, I'm, first of all, I'm not saying you're wrong about what you're saying. Secondly, I'm not saying that you are very precise in what you're saying. But if you speak in a philosophical, consuponable, all those kinds of terms that even Borker does, you have to still bring it back. Because if you can't explain it simply to somebody, and it's really complicated, my feeling it gets, complication usually means muddied, not precise. So what, as much as you say precise, if you use special terms that people don't don't necessarily know off offhand or knew offhand and don't remember you have to have the ability to come back and explain it if you ask me how to sit down and explain to somebody what integrals are and what differentials are in calculus I my degree is in math I will not spew off about a bunch of things about summations and infinite summations and those things I will say to you in colloquial terms how to do it and why it's there and I can do that so that's what I'm saying. Um, I think what's going to happen is you're going to you create barriers that way. You can be very precise in your own terminology, but you have to be available right away at an instance uh, at an instance notice to be able to explain it in an extremely simple way. That's what I believe in, and I think a lot of scientists are precise. Yes, using um, how do you say obscure. Uh, terminology which you have to go look it up here here's what happens um, we have a, a samba group um, for 25 years and uh, sometimes I teach Brazilian percussion and someone comes up and it goes and I play for it blah, blah, blah. well go online it's there think that I'm good teacher of my own stuff that I like I'm just saying it's just a comment on how to do it if you want to take someone there you've got to give them a good reason to be there because otherwise they're going to have to just, okay, I'm going to have to invest all this stuff into stuff that I don't even understand and then when I get there, will I even understand it? So I think you have to either approach it from a top down and get us there or be able to, in that sentence, re-say that sentence in a way that people who don't need to go to Google and look it up. That's what I'm saying. I love Bill Gates, so do I. He's a great community. I love the guy. Google terms, see there's Google terms. I said I would do this. Energy is a sum of force along any object's path. Energy is a sum of force of this of the force along an object's path. Uh that may describe kinetic energy um, if I'm getting that right I don't know it makes me think for sure why does space, space exist now you get to some things that we call assumptions assumptions you're not going to be able to explain let me put it this way why does space exist is an interesting question but how here's another interesting question why don't we know what light really is and why can't we manipulate it the way, the way we want why don't we know what magnetic fields are and why can't we manipulate them the way we want why don't we know what gravity is why do we say gravity bends light without having a model we have so many basic things to actually solve that bigger questions philosophical questions are interesting but let's get to the basic we're, we're, like we're, all, we're we're really far off track from being 
scientifically sophisticated. So my, my feeling is let's stick to those kinds of things and let's see if we can get ourselves with those answers before we get into much more philosophical uh, answers, questions. And, um, an impulse is a change in momentum. Mm, yeah, um, I would say it's simpler that um, you have a force with a moving body compared to another. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's normally used in linear sense. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah, I mean, uh, any time of pushing, for instance, gravity. Gravity is um, the inst the small particles that make gravity that are making gravity the force of gravity in our model for instance um those are pushes the entire universe that we have are just kinetic energy it's just push it's two things hitting each other um okay and it says thus okay it says here uh it normally is used linear sense but you can also have impulses around the curvilinear path Okay, here we go. How does it get into curvilinear path? That's my question. In fact, that's why I believe in infinity. If light is bending, if, for instance, magnetic fields are going around the Earth, right? Why is it going around? They're going in circles. They're supposed to be, uh, it's a Newtonian world. Um, it's going in a straight line. The only reason something doesn't go in a straight line is you have some type of field around it, and the field to us is always particles. So what happens is, is to have a tor torsional, anything that goes, that's, that's why I wanted to ask, because I wasn't sure. I was going to ask you, are you talking about things going in corkscrews or even circular? Then you have to have a force that makes that happen. And in our model, it's a, it's a gravitational force below that. Light bends, it does bend, not because of gravity. G1, it depends on what you call gravity. But um, it doesn't bend the way Einstein says it is. But light does bend because when you put a um, light at a prism, a not a rectangular one, well, in a rectangular one, it does do it. It doesn't make a rainbow. And we know why that is in our model, why that happens. But what happens is it'll, it'll bend, right? It, here's, here it goes. It goes in. Light comes in this way. Then you see it go at a, 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 a different angle and then it comes back out the same angle it sort of undoes itself well that bending is caused by something um, anytime you have any any particle that's going like this and then changes direction something's hitting it so what we say is g g1 gravity makes um, um, g1 particles in all random directions that's what we call gravity gravity is particles in random directions that are similar size that cause a, a pressure around things and they cause pressure differences when things are in, in the way of that um, that happens with planets going around the sun that's the what we call the one level gravity one level gravity two levels what makes light bend and that's what the g2 particle is the g2 particle is responsible for put, for keeping nucleons together just like uh, G1 particles are, are keeping two suns together in a, in a, in a um, uh, dual. Uh, did you ever notice, like, well, wait a minute, you've got a sun. We're actually a helium atom, and we have a lot of suns, two sun systems. Well, what I'm saying anyways, the, I'm kidding. Off. Anything that's torsional, you have to tell me why it's going that way. So that's okay. I just need to know that way. All right. So angular momentum, yeah. Well, so that that's what he's saying. Uh, it's normally used in a linear sense, but have impulses in a curvilinear path. You got to tell me how, why, why the curvilinear. That's all I, I'm saying. Okay. Uh, space exists to separate things. It is a concept, uh, not an object. It doesn't exist to separate things. It, it's there. It, 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 unless you're, I don't know, you're giving purpose to things. It, it, no, it's space. and There are things what we call assumptions. And assumptions are those things that you say exist without any explanation because you don't have them. If you say it exists, well, why? I mean, I, I understand what you're saying, but space exists to separate things. That means somebody made that decision about that. That's the way I look at it. Who decided that's what it does? Um, 
uh, in space you can have more things and there's distance between them yeah I mean I can see a little bit Illuminati I can sort of see it yeah I mean it's a philosophical thing yeah I, I wouldn't get too upset by that no it's a concept yeah it, it is if particles move from point A to point B not just up and down won't the edge of the universe get awfully crowded and the closed system we all uh, where do all the particles <laughs> I hope that's facetious question though we think it's infinite as you go in one direction you're not coming back and it's probably full going in all directions we're not every time we get a new telescope we see further and we see more galaxies it's, uh, there's even a paper um, you can go on uh, Ray Gallucci uh, look up Raymond Gallucci at wiki.naturalphilosophy.org. You'll see a paper where he mm -hmm. looks at the distributions of galaxies, and they only they show that they're not from an expanding anything. So I normally view space as empty, like Newton did. Yeah, that's what I say. Um, really, it is used to describe a relative lack of stuff. Yeah, space. Yeah. So compare two different densities of different. Yeah, I think I like that better. Uh, Illuminati, I like that. I like that idea. It's used to describe a relative lack of stuff. Yeah. Roughly speaking, yeah. Force the four straight lines. Torque for circles. <laughs> there you go. You got that problem again, in my opinion. Okay. The problem is, is you can talk circles and circular motion, but you've got to say why. So you say, Dave, I do believe in infinity and there are forces below it doing it. That's all you need to say to me. Otherwise, I would say, magic. They go in circles because, you know, I'm talking like uh, Kermit the Frog there. Again, Illuminati, love your work. I love your, you, you're a really brilliant mind. I love really listening to your stuff. Enjoy, enjoy immensely. Nothing as it seems. I don't have a clue what you're trying to say. I don't know. Oh, nothing as it seems. Oh, you're looking at nothing as it seems, what he's saying, I guess, huh? Space is dimensionless. What is the space? In, yeah. Yeah, I mean, again, you're getting caught, caught up in terminology, and terminology certainly is one of the things that, oh my goodness, what time is it? Two hours and 15 minutes, I guess because people slip in and slip out, but I'm going to have to get going here, uh, uh, really. Not that I, I sh but, you know, this is going to be a long recording. People are going to I'm not going to listen to that. But um, first of all, according to science, there is no up and down in space. Yeah. Photon are static, medium and mobile. Um, I would just say to you this as well. Nothing isn't as it seems. Be very careful with vocabulary. Very careful for coming up with the using words to describe some feeling or some idea you got to be really careful because when you use those words, other people will read those words and they're going to try to interpret what you mean by them. If you have a word and I have a word and they mean, they're always going to mean something different. No, no, no two words are exactly the same. Grandma and both of our minds has a lot in common, but there are things that are different. What happens is you have a, a big problem in communications. So what you want to do is be able to always explain it in plain English. And if you can't, it's like my architecture, uh, I have a degree in architecture, and my architecture teacher always said, if you're the idea of your building, if you can't explain the big idea of your building to your mother, it's a bad idea. So that's what I would say. Keep yourselves be very careful with vocabulary very careful because you get involved with it you get obsessed with it you use the words those words become things and that's an objectification of language um, that's what we do that's why so many people you see these cults now they are cults of places oh the whole universe I just saw one today the whole universe is full of this energy Energy is a concept, it isn't real. And so you have to be careful because you objectify it. Einstein and the mainstream science does that all the time. They take space, 
which is the absence of mass. They put it together with time, which is totally related to movement. There is, you know, time makes no sense without movement. Everything's in movement. So you take space, which is really nothing. You put it together with time, which is a concept that we use to describe movement. And then you objectify it and make it a thing. Dr. Glenn Borkert, go and read him. Be careful to not get all, I mean, be precise with your words, but be able to, I go f further than Bill Gade, Gates. Yeah, you can be precise all you want, but you should be able to describe those things, not in some, you know, you know way that no one understands. You want to be real careful about taking term on terminology that you have to become specialized in. That's my, my feeling. Because in our model, we don't have anything. We don't, you know, most we can do is we'll call something a field, but we'll tell you exactly what that is. A gravitational field, random particles of the same size moving in random, all in straight lines. They can bash into each other, fine. They hit things, fine. But, you, you know, the moment you start, oh, and then there's, yeah, we have things, that, for instance, the right-hand rule in electrical engineer. We believe that there is a chiral motion, but we tell you why and where and how that happens. We just don't say, oh, there's motions. There's these motions in the universe. Yeah, but what are good are they for? It's not a, it's not a necessarily natural thing. Just be able to explain those things. You got to make sure that you don't objectify the terminology you come in, fall in love with it and make them into things that they're actually just fancy words for something simpler so anyways my goodness I, it's going to be two and a half hours folks i can't do that um anyways um uh i'm going to i'm going to take i'm going to stop now uh i do appreciate everybody's support um i applaud all of you i mean for even coming here um, unfortunately, hopefully with time, it's going to be less and less. Uh, I will tell you this. I've had the experience of talking these kinds of things with most people. And most people don't get up, upset about it. The people get upset about it are the people who are intellectuals. Those people who at your parties think they know stuff and you say something like Einstein wrong. They go, it can't be wrong. Everyone not know about it. Why would you know about it? So don't. those people aren't worth talking to. Most people are uh you know uh, um available for these kinds of discussions believe it or not and i appreciate everybody's work out there all the things that you're doing i'm not on your case because i'm here i'm 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 criticizing what you do i love everybody's work uh you know steve send me your stuff uh, again i am i'm only being your science therapist because i've been around these this type of thinking for decades, more than one person. i am not been in isolation. And I'm not saying that you can't be in isolation, do your thing, but isolation often produces its own vocabulary, its own little worlds. And I'm not saying that they're wrong, but it also produces sort of a cult. And when people get into it, they go, oh, well, I subscribe to so-and-so, but you just don't understand it. Go watch his video on that. And that, I think, is not a good sign. I, I think that you need to be able to, in colloquial words, tell what you're all about what you're trying to do. You know, I, that's what we're trying to do with our, our theory, our theory, our model. Our model is simple. Everything that has a force in the universe is a particle going forward, and that's all it is. There's nothing else. The organization comes in from the, the infinite levels up and down, but I don't. we don't have, like, I don't think we have any special vocabulary other than what we have to label things. I mean, we've got a particle and we've got to put a name on it and we don't want to name it the photon because it's not a photon, it's not a graviton, it's not an electron, um, it's all of those things. So what do we name it? Electrophototon? Electrograviton? Uh, I mean, we actually thought of those things and we just said no. So we're just arbitrary labels. They have a, a sort of a reason. I'm not saying that Ours is the best. I'm not saying that that's the way to do I'm just saying that don't, you know, we don't want to get into real fancy, you know, just be careful. But I applaud you all. Congratulations. Keep up the great work. Um, uh, I'll, 
uh, maybe even do one on um, Illuminati. I may do something on that, uh, on your work as well, because I think there's some really great stuff on the thing that you have shown. Uh, that's really great. So um, I don't have a cult, and me and myself and a non-existent. <laughs> Anyways, congratulations to you all. And remember what I said, um, I am always asking you to stay critical and to stay thinking don't believe anything i say you want to you know try to understand that i do have that the reason i am here is because i'm communicating uh many years of many great minds and trying to synthesize so that we I, you don't fall into that same trap just like a parent does to their kids i'm trying to say okay you may have the theory and i that's why i never poo poo anybody's theory i never say oh that's wrong uh, you may have it, but I'm just trying to keep you on the straight and narrow and not to fall into the traps so that 10 years from now, you're into your own little vocabulary and little world. No one's understanding you. You don't know why, for instance. And maybe we can even talk about that in our next time. Let me write that down. Um, vocabulary and your own little worlds and what that means, what's good and bad about it. All right. Uh, that's what we'll do. Vocab and own world i'll remember the rest of it okay stay critical stay thinking i'm david d hilster i'm your science therapist and we're going to get everybody science woke a lot of most of you are already uh ciao for now and i will leave you with our stinger <laughs>